Hi, I'm Victoria Bartle. I'm a contributor to the Cash Alumni website. So you might have read some of my blogs about living with invisible illness and accessing social care. I wanted to do this video for International Day of Disabled People to talk to you directly and in more detail about my experiences of receiving care as a 40 something year old woman with invisible disabilities. To raise awareness of people in similar situations to myself, explain how we feel about disability stereotypes, receiving care and hopefully change people's perceptions toward us and make life that little bit easier. In 2018, I was turning 40 and I had lots of plans. Loads of my friends were thinking of trips to Vegas, having big parties and taking things off the bucket list. I was going to travel, do a skydive and move house. Instead, I got carers and a wheelchair, which wasn't exactly what I was expecting. So to give you a bit of background, I've got multiple long term conditions that cause chronic pain and chronic fatigue. And I had to stop working in 2016 due to my disabilities worsening. My mobility was severely affected and I couldn't even manage to walk across the office at work. My fatigue got so bad that I felt as if I was just dragging myself around all of the time. And it got to a stage where I just couldn't manage anymore. I was 38 years old and I felt as if my life was over. But things just continued to get worse. By 2017, I was on a ridiculous amount of pain meds and my mobility and levels of function were so bad. I was really struggling to manage to look after myself. I'd go for days without showering as that used up lots of energy. I ate ready meals or takeaways and barely left the house. So I went to see a pain consultant who recommended that I come off all of the medications I was on and just start again. His thinking was that as I was on really high doses of lots of opioids and my pain levels just kept getting worse, then the medications weren't working and we might as well see what would happen if I came off everything and just started again. This was a pretty terrifying plan, but I really couldn't see any other options. And as I wasn't working and didn't have a family to look after, then I figured I might as well do it and hopefully we could find a better course of treatment to help me. So in January of 2018, I turned 40 and my health was the worst that it's been in my life. I could barely make it around my small flat to be able to look after myself. I was desperate for help, but I didn't really know where to turn. So I called adult social care services through my local council and they sent a social worker out to assess me. I'd already had an occupational health assessment from the council and I had aids in the house, which really did help. But I knew that I needed more practical support and I simply wasn't coping by myself. The process of sourcing care was absolutely exhausting. Once I'd contact the council, I had to have an appointment with a social worker as well as a financial assessment. And having to explain your disabilities to a stranger is never easy. But if you take into account that I have to do it a lot for benefits and to medical professionals and family, then also try to think about trying to explain chronic pain and fatigue, which is really difficult to understand if you haven't experienced it. So telling someone that, yes, I can cut up my food to eat it, but it hurts. But if I have food that doesn't have to cut up, then I, use, I can use some of the energy that I'm saving to put the food on a plate and put it in the microwave. It just sounds a bit bizarre. So trying to explain my methods for energy saving, pacing myself and being able to do the basics of self-care was really difficult to do. And it can get embarrassing. If someone has had chronic pain or fatigue themselves, then they can understand. But if not, it becomes really difficult. And my analogies work with some people, but not with others. Saying that it feels like you have flu all the time and it never goes away seems to be the one that works the best. But even then, I'm never 100 percent sure if the other person actually gets it, because how on earth can you imagine having flu for your entire life? The financial assessment that I had was pretty straightforward and I did it over the phone. And if your clients do qualify for financial financial support, then there's some options that they need to think about, like direct payments and CHC budgets. I started to get involved with these when I was helping my friend with her care needs. And financially, it was really complicated with lots of rules, restrictions on how you spend the money and then more applications if you use the CHC process. So I'd advise them to get some help and support from a specialist if they have to deal with any of these systems. After speaking to the social worker, I found out that obviously, yes, I did need care. 
I'd been struggling along, along for much longer than I should have, and I, I was at a stage where I was just desperate for some help. The council could provide it through a care company that they used, but I didn't qualify for any financial support. So I was told that I might as well pick my own company, pay them directly, and then not have the charges involved with using the council services. And this was frustrating to say the least. Not only did I now have to pick a care company and employ them, but I also had to organise everything from rotors to payments, which turned out to be a really big job and one that I could have done without. My, there are lots of stereotypes and preconceptions. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There's lots of stereotypes and preconceptions around people with disabilities and more so with invisible disabilities and illnesses. Because the thing is, I look fine. In my house, I don't use a walking aid, which is usually the only visible thing about my disabilities apart from the subtle things like me walking really slowly, wincing with pain sometimes and moving carefully so as not to cut, hurt myself and wiggling and stretching about all the time to try and ease my muscles and joints. So I didn't want to be judged. I didn't want to be worrying about what the carers might be saying about me behind my back, that I was a faker, that I didn't really need care, that I seemed fine, that I could do things some days and then said that I couldn't manage them on other days that I should just try harder and push through. All of the things that those of us with invisible illnesses assume that people are thinking about us all of the time. What I wanted was to feel safe, looked after and not judged in my own home. And I was really scared of this happening. So I made sure to explain my conditions fully, what I could and couldn't do and why I needed help with things that in my mind were quite easy, as it would mean that I could save energy and use it for other things like going out once in a while, having a conversation with a friend or maybe even having a shower. I was also really worried about the carers having experience of working with people of my age group, as all the websites, information and general knowledge of care recipients are of the elderly. I wanted to make sure that the people who were going to come and help me were used to helping person of my age with similar invisible conditions, just so that I'd feel more comfortable receiving the care. I found finding the right care company quite a big job, the council social worker who assessed me sent me a spreadsheet of the care companies they used so I could read through the information they had to narrow it down a little. Then I looked at the websites and contacted about five different companies. Three of them didn't get back to me. So with the two who did, I asked for an appointment to discuss me becoming a client. What I should have done is also look at their CQC reports and even ask for recommendations from friends and family or local online groups. And this was a mistake that I made the first time I employed a care company. And I experienced similar problems to those mentioned in the CQC report, which I would have known about if I'd read it. So when I chose the next company that I used, I made sure I'd done a bit more research. And then when I helped a friend to organize her care, I also made some phone calls before having face-to-face -face meetings to fully explain her needs and see if the company had any relevant experiences and the necessary expertise as she had similar worries to mine, that because we're young-ish and look okay, that the carers would judge us and assume that we didn't need care and were exaggerating our pain, fatigue or limitations. So doing your research is vital. And from a care company's point of view, please don't take it personally. We're just trying to find the right fit for us and our needs. The main thing that I think care companies could help with is just to be honest about what you can provide. My friend whose care I helped with had three different companies terminate her care due to being unable to meet our needs. We explained about our mental health conditions during our initial conversations and how the carers would need to interact with her and behave in our home. So it was really frustrating, time consuming and traumatic when they terminated our care and we had to go through the entire process over and over again. Having care when you've got multiple conditions that affect you physically and mentally is something that I found that care companies struggle to deal with. If a client tells you that their OCD behaviours are going to seem odd to the carers, but if the toilet isn't cleaned with a toothbrush, then they're not going to be able to relax. Then you need to listen and ensure that carers are fully briefed around the client, their conditions and the issues that could arise during your care of them. 
And I think that providing training around invisible illnesses could really help carers to feel more confident when working with clients with these conditions. Making sure that your admin process is straightforward and effective is also essential. If, like me, you had to provide rotors for when you want care, the length of visits and days when you don't need it due to appointments and other commitments as I had fluctuating conditions, then care companies should be able to adapt to this or say that they can't before you employ them. Not everyone needs four visits a day every day to do the same things as lots of care packages seem to expect. We're individuals with different needs and need different types of support. Navigating the extra admin of employing carers is a time consuming job and when you've got a chronic illness, limited energy levels and are constantly in pain, then having to chase things up and check for mistakes were just more tasks that I really didn't need. So please make things as simple, efficient and straightforward as possible. Once I'd decided on the company that I wanted to employ, I was introduced to the care team that'd be looking after me and they were all so lovely. They were around my age and had experience of caring for people with similar conditions. They weren't at all judgmental and genuinely wanted to help me, so I was thrilled. I had to liaise with the office on numerous occasions, checking the care I'd requested, reviewing our invoices, which were often incorrect, and chasing information about who the carer would be so that I could decide what to ask them to do. Everyone's got different skills and abilities and some of my carers were really good cooks, so I'd have them batch cook me some meals, while others were better at hanging out my laundry the way that I like it done. So I needed to know who I was getting for each visit so that I could plan what jobs I was going to get them to do for me. The amount of admin, chasing things, querying bills and contact the, the office was just too much for me and I had to change to a different company. I needed help, not more work. The second company that I employed were all briefed on my conditions. I went through everything all over again and explained my concerns about being judged and was happy with the team that they put together. I was getting about one or two hours of care a day and this involved doing household tasks like hanging out my washing, putting away food deliveries, chopping food and batch cooking meals, some general tidying and washing my hair for me. I didn't want any more personal care than that. I wanted to be able to shower and dress myself, so I asked the carers to do other tasks that would mean that I had the energy to complete the personal tasks myself. Plus, I, I only got dressed on days that I was leaving the house and pretty much lived in pyjamas for about three years, so I saved quite a lot of energy there. But this was really important for me as I'm very independent, and the fact that my health had meant that I had to give up so much of my life already made me want to hold on to as much as I could. I was struggling with grief over the life that I thought I was going to have. I was so sad that I, I couldn't work, travel, move house or have a family as I was just too ill. To support my mental health, I'm actually really lucky in that I've got a psychologist that I still see regularly through the fatigue clinic that I attend. And he's helped me so much with these feelings of grief and sadness, learning to accept my disabilities and continue to live positively with them. But during the time when I was receiving care, I was really low. My conditions had progressed to a point where my life was very different to how I expected it to be. And managing the simplest of tasks, such as cutting up my food, was an exhausting challenge. Learning to accept this, accept help and allow people to do things for me was a process and one that my carers definitely supported me with, even if they didn't know it. Simply by being there, listening, not judging and helping me to live my life independently. Having to have people help you just to live your life is really difficult to accept. I felt weak, useless, a burden and just a waste of space. Most days the carers would be the only people I would see or talk to and just having someone come into my home with a positive attitude, a smile and wanting to help me with my day to day jobs was a massive help both mentally and physically. I got to know a lot about their lives and them about mine. I'd sit and chat to them when I was up to it. And on days when I couldn't manage this, they'd make me a cup of tea and bring me my hot water bottle. I never felt judged, always accepted and, and treated like me. Just having people see you as you is a huge thing for people with disabilities and long term conditions. So we often get stereotyped and looked down on because of our health. So the attitude of my carers was amazing and helped me to manage my depression and anxiety as much as the jobs that they did around the house helped me to manage my pain and fatigue levels. 
But acknowledging to the world that I had carers was a very different thing to it, accepting having them myself. I was afraid of judgment, of pity, of being looked down on, thought as a burden, a drain on society, a waste of space. So I didn't tell people straight away. My family knew that I was receiving care, but I didn't share this with everyone unless I knew them really well, felt comfortable with them and secure that they wouldn't judge me. I think that at the beginning of my receiving care, I went a bit overboard when I was asked how I was by the carers, maybe sharing a bit too much so that I wouldn't feel that they were thinking that I was faking my illness and asking them to do jobs for me that I should have been easily able to manage myself. The continuing voices in my head telling me that I didn't look sick enough to need this help. And the societal judgments that I've heard about other people now apply to me. And I want people to believe me when I explain how my conditions affect me. I still do this now with some people. When I ask delivery men to carry things into the house for me and they look at me as if I've just asked them to dance a jig for my own amusement, I'll wince, walk really slowly, hold my hip and try to look disabled in the hope that they won't leave and immediately put me on the list of demanding customers. I'll do it in restaurants if I'm going towards the disabled toilets and it's a day when I'm not using my walking stick or rollator. And this makes me really sad as we shouldn't feel like we have to do this. Another preconception that people have is around independence. Society tends to assume that if you have carers, then you're not independent. I've had people say this to me with comments like, you can't look after yourself, you need help and you've got carers, with the implication being that because I don't do every single job for myself, then I'm not a fully functioning independent adult. I massively disagree with this viewpoint. When I had carers, I was living in my own home, managing my health, managing my care and all of the life admin that goes along with being an adult. Yes, I had a cleaner and carers doing some jobs around the house, but how does that make me less independent? I think that there are very few people who actually do do everything for themselves. If you live with someone else, then you share the day-to-day -day tasks. So how is employing someone to do things for you any different? It's simply the term carer that makes me sound less independent and less capable. This prejudice is so detrimental to people with disabilities that it can put people off accessing help to be seen by society in a certain way. And it can also mean that people hide the fact that they receive care and become ashamed of it, taking on an extra emotional burden that just isn't necessary. I was also worried about having carers and still going out to see friends, have lunch and do fun things. I think that there is an assumption that if you're so ill or unable to care for yourself, then you're too ill to go out and do nice things. I stopped posting on social media because I had a few comments that it didn't look very good, that I was talking about being ill and needing carers, and then I was posting about being at a concert or something else that was deemed inappropriate for sick or disabled people to be doing. It took me a while to get my head around the fact that I wasn't doing anything wrong and that other people's assumptions were born from systemic ableism, stereotypes of people with disabilities, and the negative media surrounding benefits claimants. And they were, and still are, not my problem. People tend to assume that you're faking or exaggerating your illness or disability simply if you go out, do fun things, or post on social media, and that's a really stressful preconception to live with. It makes people makes me and people that I know say no to things that we would enjoy, keep our social activities to a minimum and only post online about things that are deemed to be suitable for disabled people to do, like go to hospital appointments. So what I'd like to see in the future is the underlying fear of being judged, looked down on, disbelieved and consequently financially impacted by benefits issues just gone from society. Lots of people that I know won't do things in case they get reported for benefit fraud or they feel like they're being spied on by the DWP and could lose their benefits. And this has a massive impact on people's lives and their mental health. Financial security is a huge stressor. And if you're constantly worrying about your actions being judged by other people to be inappropriate, which could then affect your ability to pay your rent, then your overall stress and anxiety levels are obviously going to increase. I'd love it if people in similar situations to myself didn't have this constant stress. The ableist judgments didn't so dramatically impact our lives. And just because we don't look sick, it doesn't mean that we aren't struggling. Living with chronic illness is very challenging in itself. And having to think about how other people are seeing us, judging us and assessing our activities to see if they fit into the stereotype of a person with disabilities 
just makes things harder. If everyone was just a little bit kinder, I really think that it would make a massive difference. If someone tells you they're in pain, then believe them. If someone in their 40s or any age needs carers, then accept it. If you're a carer for an adult, then accept what they're telling you about their conditions and how they affect them and what they need from you. But then you've got the bigger question of how do we break down the existing and entrenched stereotypes of people with disabilities? And I think that simply by being our honest individual selves in public and online, without filter, shame, embarrassment or fear, then people without disabilities will see that we're not stereotypes. We're not fakers or exaggerators of our conditions. Yes, we need accommodations, but shouldn't the world be accessible to everyone? And ultimately, what does a disabled person look like? So yes, for my 40th birthday, I celebrated by getting a wheelchair and carers. Both of them made my life easier and better. Having carers was exactly what I needed at that point in my life. Currently, I don't receive care, but I do still have a cleaner, a gardener and a weekly blow dry to make sure that I'm using my energy for the more important things in my life and the things that bring me joy. If I need to employ carers again, I'll approach it with more confidence than I did last time, as I'm now much more accepting of myself, my conditions and the limitations that they impose on me. Managing my health feels like a full time job sometimes and having carers did make it much easier. So I definitely won't be so nervous employing them in the future. And I won't put it off for so long either, as I completely understand the benefits of having care. And I've got nothing to prove to anyone if they've got judgments about it. Oh, and during my 40th year, I also had a fab time celebrating. I had a holiday in Tenerife during a good month when I went on a submarine trip. I took a road trip around the country for a couple of weeks to see friends and family. I went to some concerts, saw some stand-up comedy and generally had a great time when I could. Yes, a lot of my time was spent in my flat, on the sofa, watching TV, reading and playing games on my phone. But that's what my life looks like and it's no less important than anyone else's. So this is what a disabled person looks like. I hope you've got a better understanding of what it's like to live with invisible disabilities, the prejudices and stereotypes that we're faced with, and can empathize, empathize with those of us who receive care and see how it, it can impact our lives. If you'd like to find out more about me, you can read the rest of my blogs on the alumni website or have a look at my website, which the address is on the screen. Thank you so much for listening and happy International Day of People with Disabilities. Thanks. Bye.